Yes, go ahead. Amen. Praise the Lord. Heavenly Father, if we come before thy throne, I thank you, Lord, you're not a respecter person. And Jesus, you're still on that throne of mercy. Lord, I just pray, Lord, that you continue, Lord, touch this, brother, this man, Lord, as you would see fit, Lord. Lord, as we look into your word this morning, have your way, I pray, with this vessel of clay. We're asking now in your precious name, in that name of the Lord Jesus Christ, amen. Be seated this morning. If you have your Bibles with you this morning, I want to start in the book of Genesis. I want to continue on in a message, the New Jerusalem. When we look at the Garden of Eden, actually it's a portrait of what God would one, one day would want to do with not just Adam and Eve, but also every redeemed child of his that once sin is completely eradicated from the planet, God once again would return with his full presence, not on two individuals now, but on the whole family. Now as we look at God's plan, and sometimes we wonder, Adam, why did you go the route you did? Eve, why did you sin? And Adam partook. But really, when we look at that instance there, we could say, well, Adam, you could have saved us a lot of heartaches and headaches had you not made that first mistake. And when God had planted them in a geographical spot in the Middle East, which was called Edom. But what made it paradise was the presence of God over the whole situation. And we're going to read just uh, verse 27 and 28 in 1st Genesis. So 
So God created man in his own image, and the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. Hey, do you know what? They got along. Because both of those attributes was in Adam. All right. I won't go there too far. But just to show. In verse 28. And God blessed them and said unto them, Be fruitful, multiply, and replenish the earth, subdue it, and have dominion over the fish, the sea, over the fowl of the earth, and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. That was Adam's commission before he even fell. I mean, understand. Now, had Adam not sinned, he could have lived in a natural body that would have been immortal in the sense that his physical body would live out throughout eternity. But God placed them on the planet. Had Adam not sinned and reached his hand and partook of the tree of life, then God said he would live forever with that. That would be the complete completeness where God could have complete fellowship with Adam. Now what was that tree of life that Adam was to grab? He was born sinless. He was an offspring. But it's not the born again experience like you and I because we're saved out of sin. But the Spirit of God would have fused in that measure in Adam like it does to you and I in time. No? Yes? All right. Because had he reached out and got that portion... Because God wanted to see how he would walk. Now God knew that man would fall. But had he not fell, the reason I'm saying this, because later on in the message, I want to point to something. Now that Adam, had he not sinned, in, the, in God's time he could have reached out, not with his hands, but with his being, that a measure of the Spirit of God would now fuse with his spirit. All right. Had that happened, God, in way back in eternity, when he looked at the family of man, the plan would have been changed. What do you mean? Well, when I look in the last chapter in Revelation 21 and 22, we see the new Jerusalem, that city. And that city is, make, is made up of three classes of people. What do you mean three classes? I thought we we're all going to be equal. Yes, we are, in a sense, in the eyes of God. In that city, in, that, in the eternal age, now, to be that city, time would have moved on far enough that people would have multiplied on the, t on the face of the earth, build a physical city, and you'd have different classes of people before you hit the eternal age. But in the eternal age... You, just like the angels, you have three classes of angels. Cherubims, archangels, and guardian angels. There's a reason why God has three classes. And there also will be in that eternal age three classes of mankind. Mankind, one of them, which you and I are heading towards, is being in the bride of Jesus Christ, having resurrected body, not just a mortal body going into the millennium. And that resurrected body that you and I are going to receive is going to be with white linen, which determines one class, doesn't it? The next class that we will see in that eternal age, 
will be all the other groups, whether you want them to be, it doesn't matter whether they are the Jews under the altars or the Jewish, whichever covenant God agreed with them, because some of them are seen and have eternal life. They're given white robes. The great multitude will have white robes. Foolish virgin will have white robes. That would be classification too, wouldn't it? But then there's a third classification. There would be mortal man that now has been gone into that millennium, that thousand, rule, thousand years of rule under Christ. And when that millennium ends, you're going to have mortal people. They'll stand at that white throne judgment. They will have their bodies not resurrected. Their bodies will now be immortal. But in the natural sense, living throughout eternity as mortal beings. Why would you need three classes? You look, have a blank sheet on your face. God always has structures. The head of everything is God Almighty, the invisible spirit. Then the head, our head is Christ, and the head of Christ is God. It will always be in that respect. Even though that Jesus will be king for a thousand years in the millennium, when the millennium ends, he gives that kingship to God Almighty because then God's going to be all in all. But he will still have preeminence as being our elder brother, the head of the family, and it's going to be structure. And if you have a family, and don't think about our natural family in the sense, oh, me, my wife, and the, and the kids. We're talking about a human family when we're talking about the family of God. And in that family, there's going to be a large number of people. So therefore, you're going to have to have certain order in it, in order even to function in that eternal age. Well, some think, well, why do we mean we'll all listen to God anyway? No, there's going to be structure. The bride will be in a certain position even though in the, in the eternal age. You'll have the white robe category in the eternal age. And the mortal people that will be there. When the Spirit of God comes... And he says he's going to be in all and through all. In, my, in our mind, we say, well, I can see the bride. That's, that's no problem whatsoever. I can see the white robe. That's no problem whatsoever. But what about the mortal subjects? They were not born again, as we know it, being born again, being having the Spirit of God fused with us. As they walk through that thousand year reign. But there's going to be a little book open for them. And if God's going to be all in all and over all. Then I can see somewhere in that eternal age. Where? I don't know where. But somewhere when that transpires. Those mortal beings. Will reach the place that Adam could not have reached. Because he sinned. They can reach out and grab of the tree of life. So God can be in them, but they will be mortal bodies. Now had Adam, now going back to the Garden of Eden. Adam was to be the caretaker. Not the floor sweeper. Not the cleaning out of trash and things like that. Adam was to have dominion over the fishes and the, the, the planet to take care of it. And as Adam was to take care of this planet, had he not sinned, he would have still have to looked at the fishes the cattle, to watch over them. 
The whales. Well, what are you saying? That's what would have happened if Adam had not sinned in the beginning. Now, when we come to the eternal age, now there's not just Adam and Eve, now there is a whole multitude of mortal subject going in the, that eternal age from, that came out from the thousand-year reign. And by the time that thousand year runs out, there's going to be millions upon millions of mortal subjects that will have immortal bodies. In the sense their body will not die when they go into the eternal age. These will be servants, or the last, I shouldn't say the last, they will be the classification of people that will be watch, doing the final watching over the planet. Because watch, when the white throne judgment has arrived, Satan and his angels are all thrown into the lake of fire. All sinners are thrown to the lake of fire. So there's nothing now to defile the planet. That's why God, that new Jerusalem, coming out from God, not just out of heaven. And the reason it says it comes out from God, that's that anointing, and it's not the bride coming back down. How many? We went over that last Sunday. Maybe I'll go over it in a bit, but I just want to complete this a bit. Now we are standing at the edge of an eternal age. The fishes are not born again. The cows are not born again. The birds are not born again. Do we wipe the whole planet out and have nothing else, just the human family sitting there? So that dominion that was told to Adam now will be of that class of people. I hope I'm not going too far. Are we in understanding? So there will be those mortal subjects. So in other words, if you thought the eternal age, you were going to just sit there, my, where's my rocking chair? We're going to rock through eternity. No, things are going to go on. But we will never die. But the fishers will. The birds will. Because even in, gar in Adam's garden, they weren't to live for eternity. You're not going to keep old Blackie, your dog, throughout eternity as being a mortal subject. And he can live eternally with you because he's, he's eternal. Only mankind and the angels are, will have that eternity. That, immor that ability to live out, to live through eternity. All right? Now, the reason I'm approaching it in this manner, when God in his planning room, he saw that he wanted three classes of people because he foresaw the new Jerusalem. But when he put Adam and Eve on the earth, had Adam not sinned, you would never have three classes of people. Make sense? All right. So God knew that man would fail, but in his failing, it would bring about a family that God could have relationship with the different classes of, of mankind and the different classes of the angels as well. They're going to be there as well in the eternal age. Well, that's why I've read here in Genesis. Now, if man's going to have dominion, Over the earth. And when Adam sinned, he lost that power and ability to rule the planet. But he's getting it back in the eternal age. All right, now let's turn to Revelation 21.
So in Revelation, the 21st chapter, I hope you don't mind the review. Sometimes seeing it a second time helps understanding. When you read just for reading purposes, little words are very important to where things are really placed. And it says in verse 1, he says, I saw a new heaven and a new earth, and the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no more sea. So a new heaven and a new earth doesn't mean God says, well, that didn't work out. Boom, planet earth, I'll make another one. No. It's going to be redemptive new. Redemptive new in the sense when it is where he's speaking in verse 1, it will be redeemed without sin in it. That's what he's really implying to. And the new, buy a new heaven. So he need twinkle, twinkle, little star got dim and he needed to take them out and put another set of stars up in heaven? No. It's the heaven atmosphere. In today, we have... Yes, the saints, we have the godly angels, but we also have Satan and his crowd in the heavenly realm. But when the eternal age arrives, there will be no devil angels in the heavenly realm. So that's why it's a new heaven in that respect. The key to all of this is the latter part of that verse. It says, and there was no more sea. That's the point. That brings it into focus. When is this going to be? The new heaven and new earth. It's going to be when Jesus has finished ruling for a thousand years of time. And has restored the planet. And everything back to where God wants it. Then the big oceans that you and I have. Will be reduced to smaller bodies of water. And so there will be no great big Pacific Ocean and no great big Atlantic Oceans. These will be dramatically reduced in size. And that water that you, well, you say, well, where's the water gone to? It will have gone around the planet to make it uniform. Now watch. It's gone around the earth to make it uniform so that the temperature and the radiation does not strike the planet because in the millennium the earth will bring forth its full increase. That's the purpose. And I know that God will give longevity of life back to the mortal subject as they walk into the eternal age. No more harmful radiation will hit their bodies. Now, yes, God will have changed some makeup in man that he will never grow old, never decay. He, he's going to live throughout eternity once he reaches the eternal age. So all these things you have to bring into the picture as we're talking about that new Jerusalem. Now, as this, John is shown this in a vision, remember, he's getting these things through a vision. An angel is anointing him to give him the, these visions. In verse 2 says, I, John, saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem. Now it says the holy city. It's not just an anointing of the Garden of Eden. But now it has grown, man has grown from being from two people and from the Garden of Eden. By the time he reaches the eternal age, there's a large population of, of mortal subjects that are gone through that thousand year reign and I John saw the holy city the new Jerusalem coming down from God out of heaven prepared as a bride adorned for her husband when you read that sometime our mind goes on to look at that says oh that's how Jesus and the bride is going to be united Yes. And so therefore this new Jerusalem, that's just that's the bride coming down. No, it's not. First of all, 
It's a city. The bride is part of that city. The white robes are part of that city. The mortal subject when the eternal age are part of that city. So that is what the city is. And as it's related to John, it's, it's called the New Jerusalem coming down from God. Now to show the difference, when you and I have gone to the wedding supper and the week of Daniel ends, and we come towards the earth with the Lord Jesus Christ, you are not coming out from God. You are coming out from heaven to the earth. There's a difference. But this new Jerusalem is not just coming out in a sense. Let, let, me, let me put a little bit more background here. God lives in the heavenly realm. He's not in the earthly realm. So out of heaven, yes, the bride can come with Jesus at the beginning of the millennium. But when he talks to New Jerusalem, he says he's not just coming out of, from heaven where God lives anyway to begin with in that realm, but he's coming out from God himself. And the only thing that can come out from God himself is nothing material, nothing tangible. It has to be his spirit. You and I did not come out from God when we were born. You came out from your parents. Now it says about Jesus that he came out from, from God. In a sense, God spoke the word that planted the seed that made him. Now don't go to seed and mixing up the two things here. Just thought I'd throw that in there because... So he says, the new Jerusalem coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. That little word, as. If it was actual marriage, it would say is. You is married. It's not as if you're as you're married. As doesn't bring no certainty, does it? It brings a as is usually used as a comparison. So, as a bride adorned for her husband, that shows a union between the husband and the bride. There's a union that takes place. Really, that's the inference of this verse. So, in other words, what comes out from God, that great eternal spirit, is going to be a union with something that's going to be on the earth. So, that new Jerusalem, really, it's in God had to use descriptive words that you and I could understand. Enough that it needs to be revealed that it's his spirit is coming in that eternal age on mankind, which is considered as a city. Now, God could have made it very simple, and then, the, then the, every scullywag doctor of divinity would have known what it is. He could have said, in that eternal age, my spirit's coming on everybody. And I'm going to be everywhere. But he's using terminology. By using that terminology, it shows it's going to be structured as a city. A city needs structure. That's why there's three classes of people. But as, we, as you look at the millennium, at, yes, in order for that city to be reached to its full completeness, Earth, were, earth time. Man would have to start from the Garden of Eden till the eternal age to fulfill the earthly physical uh, family that's going to be considered for that city. It's people that makes the city. Just a bunch of building doesn't make it a city. 
So as people now from Adam, well, there's no chart there, but if you look at it from the beginning to the time we come to the eternal age, the physical side, in the sense of the bride having a resurrected body, the white robes having the resurrected body, and the mortal subjects, and there are millions of people on the earth, the physical part is there because God's Spirit is not going to come down on an empty spot. He's going to come down on this people. So that's why he puts his spirit to encompass, to his saying, my spirit is coming down on humanity, which I consider as being a city, New Jerusalem. Uh, well, is it, am I getting through? All right. And I heard a great voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them. And they shall be his people, and God shall himself shall be with them and be their God. You could put alongside it 1 Corinthians chapter 15, around verse 28, where when it speaks about when Jesus, when he has put down all rule and authority and has given back that to the Father, then God becomes all in all. Paul had a view of that. I can bring in, there's a scripture it talks about in, I believe it's in Hebrew, that talks about, Paul is saying, in, in, I think it's in chapter 11, verse 40. You can just mark it down if you like. God having provided some better things for us, that they without us should not be made perfect. New Jerusalem could not be made perfect without having the Old Testament saints. If they weren't included, you could not have that three, that New Jerusalem as being perfect. Now, why is it that they, sorry, why that, that they without us should not be made perfect? Because they had the word that was written they had the law and all the prophecies of the written scriptures. Us, Gentiles, we are on the foundation of the twelve apostles. Which all these things go hand in hand to make a complete picture for that new Jerusalem or that city. Alright. So God will be in other words, it says here, And God is with men, and he will dwell with them. Well, I thought God dwelt with me now. Not in the measure that his presence is going to come. Like it did on Adam and Eve, he's going to do that again in that eternal age. And God shall wipe away all tears. Do you ever wonder why, when that was going to be? Is he going to wipe all your tears when you go up to the wedding supper? No. But it will be in this for everybody. All tears for the whole city will be wiped away when then. Because it will be complete. From their eyes. And there shall be no more death. That goes along with that 1 Corinthians fifteen twenty-eight, Because he must rule till... The last of many enemies put away, which is death. And nor sorrow, nor crying there. Boy, that's going to be nice. And you won't get tired, too. This old body can get tired. Tell, don't have to tell me, but I know this week was. But I'm trying to do my best. When you're too tired, your mind sometimes... Have you ever been to the place where your mind, you're so tired, your mind's like mush? And you're not sure what you're going to say. So be careful. All right. So no more death, neither sorrow nor crying. There shall be any more, no pain, for the former things are passed away. And he that sat upon the throne, behold, I make all things new. And he said unto him, write these words, are the true and faithful. And he said unto me, it is done. In other words, death. Everything's completed. The eternal age has arrived. 
I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, and I will give unto him that is the thirst of the fountain of the water of life freely. And he that overcome shall inherit all things. I will be his God, and he shall be my son. God will be your, your and I head in that eternal age. But it goes on to the... Uh, now, this part here is just to show that these qualities are not going to be in that eternal age. These are sometimes some things that we have come out from or we hopefully battling that God should remove. But the fearful, the unbelieving, the abominable, the murderer, the whoremongers, the sorcerers, the idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in the, in the lake of fire, which burneth with fire and the brimstone, which is the second death. Now, verse 9 and 10 is where some get mixed up and try to put this into the millennium, which is not the place to put it. And there came unto me one of the seven angels, which had the seven vials. In your mind, that angel that had the seven vial, that's at the end of the 70th week. It's that angel that is implicated at that point in time. But because he is that angel at the end of the week of Daniel, doesn't mean what he's going to speak about is at the end of Daniel. All right? So he's just identifying the angel that's going to talk with the apostle John. And there came unto me one of the seven angels which had seven vials and seven last plague, and talked with me, saying, Come hither. I will show thee the bride, the lamb's wife. Well, it sounds like maybe you're at the end of the week of Daniel and you're, showing, you're going to show the wife that's going to come down. But watch. And he carried me away in the spirit unto a great and high mountain. What does that mean, Brother Fred? He carried him into the high structure of the Spirit of God, how the bride, or if you want to, where the bride is going to be located in God's, how can I put it, structure that's going to be ruling and reigning. So the bride's not at the bottom of the mountain. She's at the top of the mountain. And he carried me in the Spirit to a great high mountain and showed me, now he showed him that great city. He's not... He's saying the bride, but he's shown that bride as part of that city. And it's not the natural city where Jesus is going to sit. It's the city that's going to be in that eternal age. And the holy Jerusalem descending out of heaven. Watch that little word, from. It's coming out of heaven. That's where God is. But it's coming out from or out of God. Which is different than the bride when she comes after the week of Daniel. She comes just out of heaven. She's not coming out of God. So this is really pointing to the, the angel could have said, this is the anointing that's going to come out from God on that city that's on the earth, which is now complete, which is now rid of all sin. There's no devil, no angels, no fallen angels, nothing that offends. Now the Spirit of God can come down. So this is where the Spirit of God actually will come down, and the only time He can come down in His full measure on mankind. Having the glory of God, and her light was as... Sorry, did I miss one? Oh, I lost the microphone. Well, it's still there. You mean lost the signal. It is activated. There's always some technical glitches. We uh, sometimes talking about when we, we work on electronic things, are you working on the problem or are you working on the solution? 
It's two different things. <laughs> the problem, you don't know what it is. The solution, then you know how to go about fix it. So I, well, I say we're halfway in between here. All right. Having the glory of God and her light was like a, unlike, didn't say it was a stone, but he's using that as comparisons. It's used in this book of Revelation, chapter 21 and 22. It uses these things to compare. That's why when you look at the city, it's used to compare. Like a jasper stone, clear as crystal. Now, jasper is not clear as crystal. In the natural earthly settings. All your precious stones, because you're going to read further on, there's going to be precious stones that are in the earth. Well, an emerald is green, isn't it? Or oh, amber, turquoise? Green, okay. See, I don't know all those colors. But all those stones have emits different lights. It's showing it has different characteristics of stones. Stones, to begin with, are formed under great pressure. So here it's talking about that her light was like a stone most precious. Now there's that stone that the bride has, which is the characteristic of her identity, has been brought for you onto under extreme pressure. The bride as a whole. You say, well, I don't feel no pressure. I'm just fine. Well, maybe you. <laughs> but I guarantee if you're going to be in the bride somewhere, there's going to be some pressure. It's going to change your inner man and other things that we do. God applies that, allows that pressure to be applied. And had a wall great. Now, I've, I went through that last week. About, now, it had a wall great, high and 12 gates at the gates, 12 angels, and the names thereof was the names of the 12 tribes of the children of Israel. Now, remember, he's talk, it's talking about that new Jerusalem. When they build that new temple, that's going to be for the millennium. There's going to be the temple itself right there. Am I in the way? There's going to be a temple. I don't know if you can see it from there. But then around it, there's the temple walls. And then around that, there's the walls of the city. Now, if we're talking about that new Jerusalem, there is no bricks and mortar in the Spirit of God. But a wall is made for protection. And we have heard it being ministered to us before. That this wall is really not the sense we need to be protected from the enemy in the eternal age. There is no enemy. But it shows that we were all behind the wall of salvation. Salvation is like a wall to you and I. And the foundation of the walls was the 12 apostles. Which is... Now we're not we're not going to bury them and then oh yeah here I'm part, I'm behind that well I, I see Peter buried there and I see Paul buried over here no but I see Paul's doctrine the word is not physical remember words can dwell in the spirit realm God is thought and His thought He's imparted to these apostles which are the foundation of our your and my beliefs that's what that spiritual city. Because if we're going to live as a physical city when we get in the eternal age, poor Peter, he's stuck in cement. No. So you can't look at it in those terms. And the city lies four square. Four square or cube, God has used that to represent himself and to re and to represent perfection when Moses was told to build 
what he saw in heaven to build a tabernacle. That tabernacle area where the high priest went into and went in once a year, those measurements that's in the in First Kings and other places talks about when he talks about the tabernacle. They were Moses was told to build it specifically like God told him. Now it's not that he had to have a a ruler with a calibrated gauge showing that that me- measuring stick that has is just right. But God wanted him to build it by the same length, same breadth, and the same height. The holies of holy where that high priest went into was a cube, which is a representation of perfection. And when we see that new Jerusalem coming down, that spirit of God... He's perfect because it is also a cube. And the reason it's 15 miles long and wide and high is because his now greater amount of his spirit is coming down on mankind. But it is to show that the spirit that is coming down is perfect. Because God is perfect. And only a cube can represent his spirit as being perfect. Can't be a triangle. An isosceles triangle, a weird rectangle, no, because that, that wouldn't represent him. Although the children of Israel, as they're going through the wilderness, didn't realize when they were moving along with that tabernacle and, and God would get them to move down through time as they would journey, that holies of holy was cubed, which represented God was perfect. Another thing that what Moses was asked to build that tabernacle and all the things that was involved, it they had to move along as the Spirit of God would cause them to move along, which is a type that they had to move with the Spirit of God in the natural, which they didn't realize in a sense, the full implication, implific, uh, meaning, right, getting bad. Didn't realize the full meaning as they needed to travel through time as God would move them. Did you know that types, how that when the law ended, that the Spirit of God would move the church as she would be moving along, as that was in motion, so is the bride of Christ down through these, the grace age was in motion. Moving. They didn't move in the sense of God said, well, we've got so, much, so many thousand miles to make and we'll divide that by so many numbers and we'll do that every day. No, they move to a certain place when God says, stop, stop. That's the same thing in the grace age. God moved to a certain place. Mankind moved spiritually in revelatory understanding. Then God would stop for a purpose. Then when God felt to move it again, again he would move. All right, you can only carry that so far, but you can see the comparison. As they had to travel in the wilderness, so did we, spiritually speaking, we could only move as God would move us. That's why we run ahead of God and we can't run behind God. Now, I'm going to want to, I'll take more of this here. You here tonight, Brother Ray? Okay, we'll say somewhere next week. <laughs> I want to drop down to verse 22. And I saw no temple there, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are the temple thereof. And the city, city needed no 
as the city had no need of the sun to shine nor the moon to shine in it, for the glory of God did lighten it, and the Lamb is the light thereof. Now, it says there is no need of having a temple there. I saw no temple. Uh, well, hmm. I can see after the miraculous war, they're going to build that third and last temple that's ever going to be. In the millennium, that temple will be there for that thousand years of time. Hmm, that sounds interesting. Then at the end of the millennium, well, Satan's let loose, but before a shot is fired, he's put down. Well, nothing was in that millennium to destroy that temple. Now you're moving in the eternal age. What has destroyed the physical temple? Nothing. The physical temple, it's not what he's talking about here. Uh, sorry. And I saw no temple therein. He's looking at in the Spirit of God. In his presence, there's not going to be no physical temple there. In heaven, Jesus is not dwelling in a temple. He's seated on the Father's throne. And it said, the city had no need of light. Well, I'm sorry, you mortal beings there that just come out of the thousand-year reign. I'm going to put the lights out. I'm going to turn the sun out. You don't need it anymore. No, it has nothing to do. The sun will always shine even in the eternal age. If the sun didn't shine in the eternal age, your crops are gone, your birds are gone, your, your animal kingdom is gone, because if the planet goes dark, that's it for them. But when it says it has no need of the light of the, has no need of the, light of the sun, in the spirit, you won't need it. It's very simple. We try to figure out what, what, what can I use to show that you don't need light. Well, if we, go, if we back up way, way back, way back before the planet was ever created, when God was in his planning stage, Did he work in the dark? Because there was no sun or stars. Did he need a flashlight to work over his plan? God is light himself. So when you're in the spirit world, he is light. Those that have near-death experience that has gone on and seen the spirit world, they say they go into a light. They don't go to the sun. It's not like that new movie there, Stargate Universe, where we fly through the sun to get more energy. No, none of that stuff. How many see? And when a person dies and your eyes are shut, and those saints that have gone on, that are in glory now, they don't have their physical eyes. Are they blind up there? I wish I had my eyes. I could, somebody could turn the light. I could see something. No. The light of the Spirit of God lights the whole spirit realm. You know, there is no physical sun that can light the spirit world. His God is that source of light, if you want to, in that spirit world. That's why he has to be everywhere, and he shines everywhere so an angel doesn't fumble in the dark if he's gone down beyond another universe. I know I'm half living there, but we're getting the picture. So therefore, the city, it's the city, not the physical city that's on the earth, but it's the city that's being described, that's how God describes his spirit is coming to the earth over the humanity at that eternal age. 
and the city had no need of the sun, neither the moon to shine in it. Why? Because it's in the spirit realm. There is no sun, no moon that could ever shine anything in the spirit realm. Well, I never thought of that. Well, it's time to think about it because these days we'll be there. You know, when we go up in the rapture and we at the wedding supper, we ain't going to have to bring candles to put on the table to see what's going on. God, which is the light of the spirit world, will be there when we go to the wedding supper to sit with Jesus. Well, praise the Lord. I never knew that. Neither did I till a, a week ago. But to me, it makes sense. Because if a natural sun can't illuminate the spirit world, something has to give sight of the spirit beings to see something. I know the angels are going to be bright. They're bright, like the, but then it's only bright to the places where that angel, he's only a source of it to shine a little space. Now, Jesus shone bright as the sun when he changed, didn't he? Before the, uh, the, the apostles, Peter, on Mount Transfiguration. But did it light the whole planet? No. But he that created all of us, that spirit world, lights the whole place. More to the word light. He is that that affects that spirit world. But he is also light in the, in the terms of truth. Because his word in the spirit world acts as light or illumination to now to the souls or to the beings of those that are up there. Well, I've said enough for this morning. Well, praise the Lord. Moving on. Little online, precept here, precept there. The Lord knows all these things. Let's just stand, have the musicians to come. Lord, we approach thy throne again this morning. Lord, unless you drop the thoughts, Lord, unless, Lord, you anoint the minds, Lord, unless, Lord, you anoint our eyes, Lord, you're the one that's able to make us see, but we can only see, Lord, in, in the time that we're living in. And, Lord, we want to thank you this morning for thy word, thy spirit, and a place that we can assemble. Now take what was, token, take what was spoken, Lord, this morning, Use it as you can see fit. In Christ Jesus' name I pray. Amen. You can be seated. Musicians come. Down this road, I can see the bright light shining for me. It's far away, but the pull is strong. Someday this old road won't seem so long. When that morning finally gets here When I reach my journey's end I'll be waiting at the gate For Him to open up and let me 
I have seen a lot of signs that have led me to this place, and I know I'm on the right way to the place. I shall see his face when that morning burning finally gets here. When I reach my journey's end, I'll be waiting at the gate. Open up and let me in. When that morning finally gets here, when I reach my journey's end, I'll be waiting at the gate. For him to open up and let me in. I have seen a lot of signs that have led me to this place, and I know. Gets here when I reach my journey's end. Oh, I'll be waiting at the gate for him to open up and let me in. When that moment. Bye. 
still having trials and tests. You know, that's a good sign. But I thank the Lord that he said 70 times 7, though. Right? Not pointing to anyone. But the Lord knows he's working on us. And I'm thankful that he is. Let's just stand this morning. Brother Chris, if you dismiss us in a word of prayer. Father, Lord, we thank you, Lord, for this day. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your love, your forgiveness, all that you do for us, Lord. We thank you for your message today, Lord, the word that Brother Chris explained to us, Lord. I hope it was edifying to everyone's soul, Lord. I ask you, please, give everybody driving grace on the highways, Lord, that we may return safe this evening to hear more of your word, Lord, to be fully edified. To Amen. follow you, to love you, and just to be with you, Lord, yes. every day and every day of every day. And we ask it all, Lord, in the precious name of Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Lord bless each one. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Amen.